Hey everyone, Jan Jab back again. Last time I did a review of Unearthed Arcana's new subclasses, I got a lot of spicy takes, a lot of love for that monk of the astral way. Let's see how our sorcerer and warlock fans like the new subclasses. So these two, the Sorcerer and Warlock, they both seem to be focused more on a horror campaign. Um, I Maybe campaign is the wrong word because I don't know how either of these would really be fun for an entire campaign. Certainly for a one shot, they'd be, they'd be pretty cool. I'd definitely like to try them out. But for an entire campaign, kind of eh. But Let's take a look, see what we got. Hopefully it'll be faster than last time. The sorcerer is an aberrant mind sorcerer. What they say is an alien influence has wrapped its tentacles, or has wrapped its tendrils around you, wrapping you in body and mind. Perhaps a psychic splinter lodged in your psyche after you suffered domination by an abolith. This is sort of going back to Lovecraftian themes where you encounter something so horrible, your brain just cannot take it, and you're kind of insane, like the guy who wrote the Necronomicon. It seems like an okay device for, you know, a one-shot, certainly. This would be a great uh, setup for an NPC, but would you really want to play 20 levels of this? I mean, you would be insane the whole time. Insane characters, I don't know, they just, aren't very compelling in the long term. But let's take a look at what we got. So um, this is really set up to be more mental, more psionic than a lot of the other uh, classes are, especially in D&D &D 5e. We don't really have a lot of psionics so far. So let's take a look. Level one, invasive thoughts. So you gain the uh, ability for a bonus action you can create a telepathic link to one creature you can see within 30 feet. Until the link ends, you can telepathically speak to the target through the link. And if it understands one language, it can speak to you. So this is pretty cool, especially at level one. I mean, one of the biggest problems at level one is if the party is sort of split or at least out of eye shot, uh, you don't have like that radio communication that you might need. The other thing at level one is psionic spells. So the aberrant nature changes your mind in subtle but profound ways. You learn additional spells when you reach certain levels in this class as shown on the, on the psionic spell table. Uh, the spells count as sorcerer spells for you, but don't count against the number of sorcerer spells that you know. So they're basically gimmies. Level one, you get arms of Hadar, dissonant whispers, Level three, we'll see calm emotions, detect thoughts. Five, hunger of Hedar, sending. I don't know, sending seems a little weak if you already have telepathy. I know it's for a further, people who are further away, but still. A seventh is compulsion, Evar's black tentacles. Uh, ninth, modify memory, Rari's telepathic bond. That's pretty cool. Also level one, we have a warped being. Your aberrant origin protects you from harm. Your body might have a coating of mucus, uh, tough hide scales, or an invisible psionic barrier. It kind of makes sense with that monk of the astral way. Huh, guys? You choose the form of protection. Whatever form you take, it's AC equals 13 plus dex modifier while you aren't wearing armor. So that's pretty cool. It is definitely nice to not need that armor if you had a race that gained a racial bonus in dex or maybe if you took some class that like a rope or something i don't know where you needed dex that might be pretty cool psionic sorcerers psionic sorcery so at sixth level you can cast any of the spells gained from psionic feature by expending a spell slot as normal or by spending a number of sorcery points equal to the spell's level if you cast a spell using sorcery points, it requires no component. So that's pretty darn cool. Uh, number six, psychic defenses. 
you gain resistance to psychic damage and you have advantage on saving throws against being charmed or frightened. Saving throws against uh, advantage against being charmed or frightened is pretty good. Um, unless you're some sort of an elf race, which would already have... Well, no. Well, they would already have advantage against charm, so that's a little bit of a waste. Now, the resistance to psychic damage, there's not a whole lot in the game that actually uses psychic damage. Yeah, I know there are some, but not that many. So it's very specific, or instant specific. If you're in a certain kind of campaign where you're up against a lot of mental enemies, it's great. If you're fighting goblins or, I don't know, level 6 maybe orcs or something like that, it's kind of going to be a waste. From level 6 straight to 14, uh, you can unleash the aberrant truth hidden in your flesh. As a bonus action, you can spend one or more sorcery points to magically transform your body for one minute. For each sorcery point, you can gain the following. You gain a, a swim speed equal to your walking speed, the ability to breathe water. That's pretty cool, but at level 14, like, somebody's gonna have water breathing. It's only a level 3 spell. You gain flying speed equal to your walking speed and can hover. As you fly, your skin glistens with mucus. Disgusting, but very cool. Flying is pretty much always handy, although fly is also a level 3 spell. Now, your body, along with any equipment you are wearing or carrying, becomes slimy and pliable. You can now move through spaces as narrow as one inch without squeezing, and you can spend five feet of movement to escape from non-magical restraints or being grappled. All right, that's pretty cool. Uh, but then again, you know, at level 14, I don't know. That one that one is like 50-50 with me. It's good for getting out of jams, getting out of dungeons and whatnot. But uh, I don't know. Level 14, it just seems like with other classes, there's a lot of other ways, a lot of other spells you could use. Last one, you, level 14, your eyes turn black or become writhing sensory tendrils. You are aware of the location of any hidden or invisible creature within 60 feet of you. That's pretty cool. Um, the only, it's not quite as good maybe as Sea Invisible, although Sea Invisible won't necessarily help you find a hidden creature if they're hiding behind something. Uh, but, but that is cool. The only thing is if you could see invisible, you would know exactly what it is. This appears to just let you find the location of something and know that it is alive, I guess, or a creature. At level 18, if you actually make it, warp reality. Level 18, you become the focal point of a reality warping anomaly. As an action, you can magically radiate a transparent 20-foot radius aura for one minute. Blah, blah, blah. Take a lot of forms. Um, other creatures treat the area as difficult terrain, and when they start their turn in it, they take 2d10 psychic damage. When you activate this feature, you can choose any number of creatures uh, you can see to be unaffected by the aura. As a bonus action, you can end the aura early. If you do so, any creatures you choose within the aura are teleported to a location you can see within one mile of you. So, doing it in a cave, not so great. Doing it outside, pretty awesome. Each creature must appear within 20 feet of you and in an unoccupied space. An unwilling creature that succeeds on a charisma saving throw against your spell save DC is not teleported. This is both cool and not cool. Uh, the only sort of lame thing is this 2d10 psychic damage. Really, at level 18, it's 2d10. Now, the nice thing about this is... Oh, as an action. Okay, so it doesn't require any sorcerer points. It doesn't seem to require any uh, spell slots or anything. So that's nice. But 2d10? I mean, that's pretty lame. It is psychic damage, which the vast majority of things in the game do not have resistance against. At least you'll get somewhere between 2 and 20 points of damage at level 18. I do, however, like the teleportation. Free teleportation to somewhere you can see within one mile. That will definitely save your party's butts uh, on many occasions. 
Although, like I said, if you're indoors, in a dungeon, in a cave, uh, you're kind of screwed. But otherwise, that is pretty awesome. That is the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer. Next up, Otherworldly Patron. This is uh, talking about the Lurker in the Deep. Okay, so raise your hand if you think they've been watching Critical Role and that's where they decided to do this. Yes, or as patron, I don't know. I, I'm really behind on my Critical Role episodes, but I do recall a lot of these things being fairly similar to what Matt Mercer is doing. It kind of makes me wonder if he had a hand in the creation of this. You make a pact with an entity that lurks somewhere in the deep ocean or even in the elemental plane of water, such as a Kraken, ancient primor primordial, or monstrous being from creation's early days. You serve as the creature's eyes and ears, watching the world beyond its domain, reporting your findings. You may have gained this pact as a member of a cult dedicated to the ent entity, or after your patron saved your life when you nearly drowned at sea, just like Ford. This is pretty cool. Okay, Kraken. Yeah, all right, okay. For me, this also could be pretty cool if you are playing with the great old ones, creatures from beyond. A lot of these sound fairly Cthulhu-like. So your expanded spell list. Uh, Lurker in the Deep lets you choose from an expanded list of spells when you learn a Warlock spell. The following spells are added to the Warlock spell list for you. Create or Destroy Water. Very handy, especially at level one. Thunder Wave, pretty darn cool. Gust of Wind. Okay. Silence. Silence can be pretty awesome. Lightning Bolt. Sleet Storm. Very cool. Control Water. Yeah, I don't know. I got a campaign with a wizard up to level 12. I think I used that exactly one time. And even then, it kind of screwed over a lot of my party. Not so great. Uh, Evar's Black Tentacles. Could be very cool. Commune with Nature, uh, I guess makes me think of some hippie stuff where people are running around naked, but whatever. Cone of Cold, always a favorite. Level one, Grasp of the Deep. Gain the ability to magically summon a spectral tentacle that strikes your foes. As a bonus action, you, you create a 10 foot long tentacle at a point you can see within 60 feet of you. Lasts for one minute. Uh, you can make a melee spell attack against a creature within 10 feet of it. On hit, the target takes 1d8 cold or lightning damage, uh, your choice when it takes damage. Its speed is reduced by 10 feet until the start of your next turn. And when you reach uh, 10, level 10, it goes up to uh, 2d8. I don't know, this is kind of lame in my opinion because you could take a cantrip and I always forget which one. It's Frostbolt, I want to say. I have it on one of my characters, so I should really know. But it's basically the same thing. It's a 1d8 with a reduction of 10 feet in its speed until the next turn, except Frostbolt, assuming that's the right name, it will level up a bit. I think level six, you get 2d8 for sure. Level 11, you end up with 3d8 of cold damage. I guess this is nice because you can pick cold or lightning instead of just cold. Bonus action, you can move the tentacle 30 feet. This would be cooler if you could use it to restrain someone, but I guess you can't. So, Scion of the Deep. Level 1, your patron accepts you into its inner court of servitors. You can telepathically communicate with any aberration, beast, elemental, or monstrosity that has an innate swimming speed. Well, I guess that's kind of cool. Uh, definitely, it's cool to telepathically communicate, uh, especially with the beasts. I mean, there's a ton of swimming beasts all over. If you're in like some pirate sea campaign, this will be boss. Potentially cool. It's really going to suck if you're at a desert. Level six, you get Fathomless Soul. Uh, your patron grants you greater abilities. You gain the following benefits. Breathe both air and water. Not bad at level six. You gain swim speed equal to your walking speed. Also pretty cool and resistance to cold damage. So Fathomless Soul is, you know, pretty good benefits all over. Guardian Grasp. Uh, at the sixth level, the tentacle you create with Grasp of the Deep can defend you and others while you're taking damage. Da, da, da. Oh, that's pretty cool. 
you can use the tentacle to choose a creature uh, to reduce the damage by half. So it's a very cool defensive mechanism. After doing so, the tentacle vanishes. So not too bad. I mean, you could just summon another one the next time, I guess. Uh, oh, nope, actually, you can't because you need to... Let me see, you can... Back here in level one, you can summon the tentacles a number of times equal to your charisma modifier, minimum of one. Yeah, you know, you could re resummon it in a tough fight. You you get a maximum of five from normal upping of your of your stats. By level six, I don't know. You could probably summon it four or five times before taking a long rest, so it's not too bad. Devouring Maw. 10th level Lurker in the Deep feature. Starting at 10th level, you can magically summon, uh, magically draw forth a manifestation of your patron's insatiable hunger. Why do they always have to be hungry? Why can't they just want information or you know, just to dominate things without being hungry? A little too much Matt Mercer in her influence if you take my drift. But anyway, Choose a point you can see within 60 feet of you. For one minute, a translucent maw manifests in a 10-foot radius centered on that point. Each creature within the area must make a strength saving throw or be restrained. Be restrained. I guess it's like, uh, you put them in like a mouth prison. The teeth are, are like jail bombs or something. Any creature that starts its turn in the Maw's area takes 3d6 cold or lightning damage, your choice. As an action, restrained creature can repeat the saving throw, ending the restraint on a success. At the start of your turn, if there is a creature in the Maw's area, you gain temporary hit points equal to your Warlock level. That's pretty cool. That's a really nice feature, uh, especially at level 10. You can gain 10, get 10 temporary hit points. That's not bad at all. Unleashing the Depths, level 14. Starting at level 14, you can call your patron for aid. You choose a point within 30 feet where your patron tears through reality, manifesting a measure of its thalassic grandeur. Choose one of the following effects. So transport. You and up to five willing creatures of your choice that you can see Within 30 feet of the manifestation, grasp by the tentacles, yank through the patron's realm, teleport you to somewhere within uh, 100 miles that you have visited within the last 24 hours. Overall, pretty cool, except if you have like a typical five-man party and somebody's got either pets or you've got like a ranger with a beast companion, Oh, oh, goodbye, my beast friend, because that's not quite enough. Uh, Fury. You can direct a barge of spectral tentacles to each issue forth and strike up to five creatures you can see within 30 feet. Each target must make a dex save. On a failed save, creature takes 60, 10 cold or lightning damage and is not prone. On success, it only takes half damage and is not knocked prone. So that's pretty cool, man. 6d10, it is level 14, 6d10 might be a little low, but the fact that you can do that to multiple creatures, up to five creatures, I mean, that's pretty good. It's level 14. How come there's no like level 18 feature on this? That's weird. All right, at any rate, there's also a new spell, a new cantrip suitable for psionic themed spellcasters, Mind Sliver. Uh, it is on the Sorcerer, Warlock, and Wizard spell lists. You drive a spike of psychic energy into the mind of a creature you can see within range. The target must make an intelligent saving throw. Unless the saving throw is successful, the target takes 1d6 psychic damage. And the first time it makes a saving throw before the end of your next turn, it must roll a 1d4 and subtract the number rolled from the save. So that's pretty cool. The spell's damage increases by 1d6 when you reach uh, 5th level, 11th, and 17th. So that's a pretty standard cantrip upgrade. 
it's got some nice features and some not so great features. Uh, there are several cantrips, crossbolt again, I, I can't think of the other ones, but I think there's two or three more that do 1d8 as opposed to 1d6. 4d8 can definitely get you a lot more damage than 4d6, but the thing I like is the saving throw kind of sucks, but at least uh, the target subtracts 1d4 from its roll. So that can kind of help even against uh, more intelligent creatures, uh, or if you're playing against like wizards or something. All right, everyone. So this is has been the new UA classes, Lurker in the Deep, which is a warlock, and the Aberrant Mine for the Sorcerer. What do you guys think? Are these classes that you'd like to play? Would you play a whole campaign with these classes or more just a one shot? <laughs> Let me know what you think. Leave your comments down below. If you like the video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. You really help out the channel. And I will see you guys in a little bit. Soon we have the D&D Essentials Kit coming up. We finally, finally getting more into world building. I will have more on maps, more on how to create different aspects of your world, and I'll see you soon.